Joining us now is Gene Amdahl, formerly of IBM, formerly of Amdahl Corporation, and now of Trilogy Systems, Inc. Welcome, Gene. Gene, uh, I think it's uh, very interesting to have your perspective on IBM and the IBM PC lookalikes that have come out here because you've been, if there's anybody that's been uh, working with uh, following IBM and, and trying to uh, get at that customer's base, it's been Amdahl. Uh, and so what is your feeling about the IBM PC clones or the lookalikes? Are, can they be successful? Well, I'm not as familiar with the PC area as I am with the hot, large computer area, but I am quite familiar with IBM, and their pattern really hasn't changed over all of the years that I've known them. And that is they move into a field when the field is just proven well enough in terms of uh, it becoming of a size sufficiently large to be of interest, and secondly, that somebody has learned what it takes to satisfy that market. Once this is learned, uh, IBM is then ready to move in for their share of the action. And if they are, have the same degree of success in this area as they had in the high performance area, their architecture will become a de facto standard, not because they will have the best architecture, but because so many people will be expecting them to be successful. Mm -hmm. And the cost of developing your applications on your, even your personal computer, are going to uh, be sufficiently great so that even as a person, an individual, you really won't like to change architectures in order to uh, progress through the uh, advancements. Now, how do you track a change that IBM might make in the future? Uh, if there's one company that I've seen that's probably more secure than even Mattel, <laughs> or the U.S. government has been IBM. And how do you, how do you what, when you stock up your large inventory, how do you uh, take care of that transition that IBM might make, say, in, uh, in a moment's notice? Well, you can't do it perfectly, but if you are in a portion of the field where the technology or certain functional limitations have formed the boundary of where you could go. As those possibilities get moved forward, then, or as you expect them to be moved forward, you can expect that the uh, offerings by IBM are most likely going to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. okay, and so, so you, you have to sort of prepare. Indicators of what's going on, right? Lori, I know that you've been involved uh, very closely with the uh, whole industry as it's, as it's has switched toward IBM hardware. What are your feelings about the PC clone, PC clones? In my opinion, they are not going to have a future. Um, I think right now they're enjoying a tremendous wave because of the inability of IBM to deliver in su uh, sufficient quantities. And I think most of the clone companies, if you look at them carefully, are not creating any value. They are putting uh, hardware together. They're buying software that is available to everyone. And they're not really creating anything that makes them proprietary. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if IBM um, takes a different turn, a lot of the software generators will follow suit in many of the clone companies uh, have to protect some of their installed base, and I don't think they can turn as quickly as IBM will, because IBM will have planned this move, you know, a year or more in advance. So, quite frankly, I don't think that, uh, you know, they're going to be a long-term solution. Adam, you described earlier the computer business now is like the dishwasher business, basically, and Gene said that IBM's power is really not that it has a better technology. Uh, is, is the computer business now not really as technology-driven, but marketing and advertising and packaging? Well, I think that uh, the major difference between the PC market as it is today and uh, the mar industry that Gene was talking about is the fact that it's really got nothing to do with high-tech anymore. And for that reason, I would both agree and disagree with what Laurie said. I think the bulk of the clone companies existing today won't make it. The reason is that they look upon themselves as computer manufacturers. However, I believe that there is a vast market for clone companies. The reason is that uh, a rough kind of estimate that we've made is that there's something like 15% of the market where hell will freeze over before they'll buy IBM. There's 15% of another 15% of the market that don't care and 70% of the market who prefer IBM.
Now, 15% of the market is huge. Furthermore, there's another consideration. If you're talking about uh, people who are looking at it as though it's a dishwasher or a refrigerator, you're now talking about people who can come in to a huge install base. IBM is shipping 10,000 PCs a day right now. It doesn't really matter very much if they do go on to something else. The base they leave behind is so big that there are a lot of people who can run out their inventories. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, because they're building entirely on a low-cost, high-quality basis, you get somebody who comes in who knows how to manufacture and they can start eating into the IBM PC market more than they ever could a mainframe market because it's the same. For the very fact that it's the same, people eventually say, well, what have I got to lose? If a piece goes wrong, it's almost interchangeable. So the, people, the companies that would be successful are the ones that think of themselves as manufacturing companies rather than computer companies. That's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Gene, uh, you have been in this for a long time, starting Amdahl some time ago, starting Trilogy recently. Let's talk, let's talk about the venture capital situation. How is it different now in trying to get a computer company going than it was a decade ago? Well, a decade ago, the, there was a great recession. There was also uh, a situation in which the capital gains taxes were uh, much higher than they are today some 50 percent. Uh, with the capital gains taxes like that and with the recession, the stock market for new issues was abysmal to say the least. It was essentially non-functional entirely. And how about today? Today, uh, there's a, a rather buoyant market, extremely buoyant compared to 10 years ago. Lori, uh, what's your perspective on, on venture capital today? You just went through that, didn't you? Uh, well, I went through it twice, once in 79 when the venture capital pool was just uh, growing. Um, and, you know, I went through it again today. It depends on at what point in time you actually go out to look for money. In the history of Vector, having gone through the difficulties we have gone through, we did not have, you know, too much leverage to determine, uh, you know, determine price because we needed the cash so badly. But in many uh, startup situations where, uh, you know, you have something that has a very good angle, you are the ones who can really, the, you're the, the one who can essentially determine price because there are not that many good deals around, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, venture capital available. I'm sorry we're out of time. Thanks so much, all of you, for being here with us. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles.